On today's episode, something weird is happening on the ISS. Big news for Starship in 2025, China is up to something, and Rocket Lab doubles down with Electron. Hey, what's that smell? There is a foul odor abound on the International Space Station, and this one has nothing to do with the Zero-G toilet. To locate the source, we go over to the Russian side of the ISS and a newly docked Progress spacecraft. The new arrival was supposed to bring fresh food, supplies, and equipment, but instead it delivered a horrible and potentially dangerous smell. Here's the scoop. Russia's Progress MS-29 docked with the Poisk module on November 23rd after a typical launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome on a Soyuz rocket booster. The uncrewed supply ship was carrying 2,500 kilograms of general supplies, including water and propellant for the station. Now, when the cosmonauts opened the hatch to Progress, they were met by what was reported to be a strong smell and droplets of fluid floating inside neither of which were specifically identified in communications with ground controllers. NASA later confirmed this on their own social media posts. When confronted by the odor, Russian crews quickly resealed the airlock to progress and even went as far as to close the hatch of the Poisk module to quarantine that section from the rest of the ship. Now, Poisk is just a small node that connects to one of the four docking ports on the Russian side. So what is the smell? I know it's kind of a funny subject, but this might actually be more serious than NASA is letting on. According to Anatoly Zak of Russian Space, which is a reliable independent website, the smell was, quote, toxic and prompted the Russian cosmonauts to immediately close the hatch leading to the Progress spacecraft. Over on the US segment of the ISS, NASA astronaut Don Pettit claims he smelled something like spray paint. Both the US and Russian segments have activated additional air scrubbers to combat any potential contaminants and air quality in the station is reported to be normal. But now what do they do? The food and water and supplies are still in there with the potentially toxic odor. They can't exactly just order up a new delivery here, so this could be a problem. And it definitely doesn't help that there have been many reports lately about the health of a so-called stranded astronaut from the failed Boeing Starliner mission, Sunita Williams. While it's definitely true that Sunny and her partner Butch Wilmore are spending a lot more time in space than they had originally planned, this is definitely not a case of fighting for survival up there. Not yet at least, I mean we'll see what happens with the contaminated food situation. A lot more of the tabloid focused news outlets around the web have been pushing a story that Sunny is malnourished and wasting away in space, which is probably not true. Sunny herself says that it's not true, but it's probably worth running through some of the facts because apparently a lot of people just really don't know what life is like when you live in space. Sunny is older than your average astronaut, the median age for space travelers is 34, she's 59, but she's not even the oldest person that came on Starliner, Butch is 61, and even he isn't the oldest person in space right now, Don Pettit, who we mentioned earlier, is 69 years old, and clearly still has a great sense of smell, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. It's also important to consider the drastic changes in lifestyle when you move to the ISS. They have to exercise a lot more more than two hours per day of cardio and weightlifting, which means they have to eat a lot of food to compensate for that, typically at least 2,500 calories per day, up to 4,000 calories depending on the person's body type. They also eat a lot less salt up there because the body sheds less sodium when it's in space. So all of that combined with the microgravity environment is bound to result in some changes to a person's body composition, or the distribution of fat, muscle, and water on your skeleton. Sunny says she weighs the same now as she did when Starliner lifted off back in June. She may have lost a little puffiness in the face, but is supposedly gaining some size in her lower body thanks to all the resistance training and performing a lot of squats and deadlifts, which is something she says she doesn't do in her regular exercise routine. This begs a question though, how do astronauts weigh themselves without gravity? Well, they use this crazy machine called the Space Linear Acceleration Mass Measurement Device. Because you might be weightless, but you definitely do still have mass up there. This is like a sideways pogo stick that pushes into the astronaut's belly and sends them backwards. Then an optical instrument measures their acceleration. Then we just apply a formula, force equals mass times acceleration. We know the force of the spring and we've measured the acceleration, so now we just have to solve for m. 
if you know how to do algebra. I do not. You might have also seen this headline that claims Butch and Sonny are so desperate to survive that they're drinking soup made from their own pee. That's not news, that's just what being an astronaut is. You drink recycled water. And to be fair, it's not just their pee, it's everyone's pee. Check out our video on space toilets for more on how recycled water works in space. Imagine having a pen on your desk that not only writes beautifully, but also hovers in place, defying gravity. Right now, Novium is offering an exclusive, very limited time Black Friday deal, 20% off the hover pen with code SPACERACE, making this the perfect gift for anyone this holiday season. Now this isn't just any pen, it's a work of art inspired by space designed to ignite curiosity and creativity. The hover pen Interstellar sits at a precise 23.5 degree angle, a nod to the Earth's axial tilt, it is refillable, and comes in stunning finishes like Space Black and Mars Magma. And it's not just us who think so. The hover pen Interstellar was recognized as one of the best inventions of 2022 by time. For those wanting something even more out of this world, the premium edition includes a meteorite shard that's over 4.5 billion years old, making it older than Earth itself. Imagine owning a piece of space right on your desk. Or if you prefer a fountain pen, Novium offers the hover pen Future with a 2-in-1 interchangeable tip that lets you switch between a fountain and a rollerball pen. Whether you're treating yourself or looking for the ultimate Christmas gift, the hover pen is a timeless choice that comes neatly packaged and ready to be gifted. Don't miss this Black Friday deal, 20% off all hover pens with code SPACERACE plus free shipping to most countries. The QR code is on the screen and you'll find all the links in the description below. Trust me, once you have the hover pen spinning on your desk, you'll never see writing the same way again. Starship just got some fantastic news from our old friends over at the Federal Aviation Administration, who just released an updated environmental assessment for Starbase Texas that would increase the number of annual launches and landings from the site. The assessment examined the impacts of up to 25 launches a year, along with 25 landings each of the Super Heavy Booster and the Starship Upper Stage. This is very promising news, but nothing is confirmed just yet. The FAA says the release of the updated draft begins a public comment period that runs through January 17th. There will be five public meetings to gather input, four in-person events in Texas in early January, and one online event on January 13th. This should line up perfectly with the next Starship launch on Flight 7, which at the moment is being rumored for January 11th. That one will not include a Starship catch, but Elon Musk says that if they pull off another controlled water landing in the Indian Ocean, then Flight 8 will be a candidate for the first return to launch site from orbit. China is up to something in space. The rising space power just completed a very interesting mission with their Shijian-19 retrievable satellite. They launched this satellite on September 27th and it returned safely to Earth on October 10th after re-entering the atmosphere and deploying a landing parachute. So that's unusual enough to intentionally return a satellite to the Earth? But the stuff that it was doing up there is even more interesting. We just found out that China tested an inflatable module, something similar to the Bigelow beam demonstration on the ISS. This Chinese inflatable was much smaller and short-lived, but it shows that the Chinese are moving in the direction of inflatable habitats for their future long-term outposts. We know that they are eager to expand the Tiangong space station, and the Chinese have a long-standing plan to build a permanent base on the moon. We could be looking at the early phases of something big. It's also reported that the Chinese are experimenting with breeding in space on this mission as well. Plants, that is. They were trying to breed new mutant plants using exposure to radiation and microgravity. It's thought that these conditions will accelerate genetic mutations and may enhance food crop resilience and productivity. That could be a big deal for China because they have a relatively little fertile land compared to the overall size and population of the country. But I'm also thinking that these plans to live on the moon and in space stations, they might be trying to breed some particular new type of space vegetable. Who knows? Would be cool if they told us a bit more about what they're up to, but 
Rocket Lab is gaining an even bigger share of the space launch industry with two successful flights of their Electron vehicle in just 24 hours. One Electron lifted off from Rocket Lab's Launch Complex 2 on Wallops Island, Virginia at 1 a.m. Eastern Time. That launch used a suborbital version of the rocket called Hypersonic Accelerator Suborbital Test Electron, intended for use in hypersonic testing. Rocket Lab followed the HASTE mission with an orbital launch of Electron from its Launch Complex 1B in New Zealand at 10.55 p.m. Eastern Time on November 24th. The rocket successfully deployed into orbit a third set of five satellites for the French company Canis, which is deploying a constellation to provide Internet of Things connectivity services. Rocket Lab launched the first two sets of Canis satellites in June and September. These launches are part of a five-launch contract announced in 2021, with two more launches planned through the first quarter of 2025. These two launches marked the fastest turnaround time between launches in company history, which was previously about one week. Rocket Lab has conducted 14 Electron launches this year, which is great for such a relatively small and new company, but it is pretty far short of their projected goal for the year of 22 flights. Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck has revised that number to say that there will probably end up being somewhere between 15 and 18 Electron flights in 2024.